If you're struggling with your vitality, energy, mood, focus, or sleep, this podcast is for you. Your host, Dr. Ann Sung, ER doctor and airspace flight surgeon, will help you reach for the stars and remove the barriers or blockades that have been holding you back from living your best life. If you've been challenged by your health, relationships, or productivity, then it's time for a breakthrough. So here's your host, Dr. Ann Sung. Hello, and welcome to It's Not Rocket Science Show, and I am your host, Dr. Ann Sung. This is session eight, and this is a part one of a three-part session on aerospace medicine. Part one, I'm going to be talking about when I set the goal to become an aerospace medicine physician at age of 19, and what I did along the years in order to finally become a NASA flight surgeon 14 years later. Part two, we'll be talking about what it's like to go through the aerospace medicine residency at University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. And in part three, I'll discuss what it's like to finally become a NASA flight surgeon, what kind of work and entails, what the day-to-day is like or the week is like as a NASA flight surgeon, what you're responsible for. And so let's go ahead and dive in. I often ask quite often, you know, how do you become a NASA fly surgeon? What do you actually do? And I want to start from the beginning of when uh, the first time I was exposed to space, which was when I came to the U.S. in Houston, Texas, when I was nine years old from Taiwan, I visited the Space Center, NASA, and I think I was just completely awed by everything I saw Um, And I also read children's space books and was awed by what the astronauts did. So at that time, I knew that whatever I did in the future, I wanted to contribute to space. And down the line, you know, I went through high school trying to decide what to do and decided in medicine was a stable, secure job, which will allow me to help people, you know, every single day. So decided on medicine. And then when I was a third year medical student, well, throughout medical school, actually, I had decided, you know, said to myself that whatever I did, whatever specialty I picked in the future, whatever kind of physician I became, I would like to contribute to space and work for NASA somehow. And I distinctly remember I was studying at Borders as a third year medical student. And I didn't want to study anymore. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to Google space medicine or space doctor. That's what I Googled. And all this information started coming up with the aerospace medicine short course at UTMB and what it's like and what they actually do, the training that I required. So it just let me down this path of beginning of the aerospace medicine career. So what happened was I got in touch with the University of Texas Medical Branch uh, course uh, coordinator at the time, and I was able to speak with one of the flight surgeon, Dr. Bill Tarver at NASA. And I was also able to speak with one of the residents, aerospace medicine residents, Dr. Jen Law. And so they gave me the first description of what it's like to work at NASA and what you can expect at that time. And they recommended to me to participate in the aerospace medicine short course that they hold every year in July. You can do that as a rotation as a a fourth year medical student. So I applied and got in. And there's also um, something called a NASA research clerkship, where as a clerk, you're assigned to a research project that you can complete for that takes one month. And then you present at the end of your clerkship, which is what I did as well. A little bit about the aerospace medicine short course. It has now been renamed to the primary aviation and space medicine course. And it is held every year in July. You have to apply for it. There is a cost to it, though that is the perfect networking opportunity and perfect introduction to aerospace medicine that you can do if you are interested in this field. Most people who have gotten accepted as a resident in the UTMB program have done this because you just get to meet uh, so many people 
from NASA, from the aviation and space field that you really get to understand and network and people really get to know you before they interview you for the position. They go, you you know, pre-COVID times, you're able to visit NASA, see the mock-up of the space station, see the neutral buoyancy lab and how they operate, take a look at the medical equipment and the medical kits. And you get to hear from the FAA, the NASA personnel who has been participating in space medicine for a very long time. You get to hear from the astronaut physicians. And it's just a fantastic introductory course to let you know whether you this is the field for you or not. And w- regarding the NASA clerkship, I did as a fourth year medical student six months after the aerospace medicine course. And my project was on shoulder injury risk uh, criteria, because back then at the time when the astronauts would practice their moonwalks or the spacewalks in the spacesuit in the, at the neutral buoyancy lab, which is the large pool where they have their international space station mock-up, they were at increased risk for shoulder injuries. And so I was able to participate in that project, coming up with the criteria for shoulder injury, which is pretty awesome. It's still in use today. So that's what I did as a medical student. And now since that time, they have established something called AMSRO, Aerospace Medicine Student and Resident Organization. It is a fantastic resource and organization for you to join if you are interested in this field. There is the UTMB Aerospace Medicine Seminar Series. There are recorded lectures on there that was created by my co-resident, Dr. Amy Krakus. And it is a fantastic resource to get to know the initial physiology and the knowledge of aerospace medicine. And I would highly suggest that you check that out. And also on the website, it shows the two civilian residencies in aerospace medicine, which is University of Texas Medical Branch um, in Galveston. And then the other residency is at Mayo Clinic. So when I say residency versus fellowship. It is called a residency since there is a difference. Um, Most people, it's called residency of aerospace medicine. If you go in there, having done a residency already, like an emergency medicine, family medicine, it's two years. If you go into UTMB as a, from medical school, there's a combined internal medicine and aerospace medicine residency, and that takes four years. So it shaves one year off essentially. And then there are, of course, the military residency in aerospace medicine with the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. I highly suggest that you visit the website of AMSRO, and it has a ton of information. It also has information on mentorship, on scholarship opportunities. They have virtual seminars now with COVID going on. And so it's very easy to join in on those seminars. And in the end, they also go to the Aerospace Medicine Conference, uh, ASMA, that's held every year. So when I was in the emergency medicine residency and also critical care fellowship, I was focused on learning medicine because if you are interested in aerospace medicine, you're, you can really do any residency beforehand before you do this, the fellowship or the res- aerospace medicine residency. I have been told that if you n- go into a residency with a broad background, as in family medicine, emergency medicine, internal medicine, that it would be helpful, though it's not required because there are other uh, there is our prior program director at UTMB. He was actually uh, ob guy trained. So you don't really have to pick a specialty just for aerospace medicine. The most important thing to do during residency is to learn good medicine. Of course, you've been told this as well. Like people in medical school uh, have been told this frequently. So that is really the most important thing you can do. First, be a good physician, practice good medicine. Then I would say during the residency, you would try to network, join AMSRO and learn as much information as you possibly can about the specialty before you get into it. And if it's possible, find a mentor who's already in that field, who can introduce you to various research projects, um, you know, so that that can go on your CV. So that it shows longitudinal involvement with the specialty. 
And that's what they'll look at during their interview. Like, how long have you been interested in this specialty? And what have you done to contribute to it? And I would also suggest that if you are in medical school to look into the UTMB PASM course, the course that they hold every year in July, or look into the NASA clerkship, or you can do both. And to look at opportunities to attend the aerospace medicine conference that's held uh, every May, every, uh, every May annually. And lastly, I would say that the most important thing that you can do is to find your why. Why are you interested in this specialty? I, I know like a lot of times, you know, space medicine, being a space doctor, it's really awesome. It's really cool. Um, just to be able to participate in the mission. That's amazing. Though I want you to think about it very carefully, research the specialty very carefully about what it's like day to day. And this is why I decided to create this three-part series in order to educate you that, you know, what it's actually like day in and day out to be a NASA flight surgeon. Because a lot of times it's not, you know, you think, Yes, it's awesome to be with the astronauts. It's awesome to participate in the missions, to go to the training, to go to launch and landing. Though in between that, though, there are other meetings that you have to attend. There are other projects that you have to take care, that you have to participate in. There's a lot of reading. There's a lot of teamwork. So, it, And then there's a caveat that you're going to be with fairly healthy people and that in order to get the experience with the sick population to keep up your clinical skills, you is actually required for you to actually work outside of NASA to work on your specialty in order to keep up your clinical skills. So all those factors play into your decision. So really think about what is your why of going into medicine and what is your why, you know, for your going into aerospace medicine. And if you have a strong enough why, then everything else will come easy. You'll have that drive to achieve your goal even after 10 years, after 14 years. So again, just to reiterate, if no matter what age you are, what stage of training you are in, there are always opportunities for you to get into this field. And with Commercial crew vehicles starting like launching already. There's going to be more and more need for aerospace medicine physicians with Virgin Galactic carrying commercial passengers. There is definitely going to be a need for you to assess these passengers to work for these companies in the future. So we're just in the beginning stage and it's never too late for you to start looking into further training to get into this field, to participate in this field in any way even in just, if it's just research. So thank you again for spending your time with me and please go to the next part in session nine, part two on what it's like to go through a two-year aerospace medicine residency slash fellowship. And remember, everything you need is already within you now. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. One lucky listener every single week that posts a review in iTunes will win a chance in the grand prize drawing to win a private VIP day for a health and life makeover with Dr. Ann Sung herself. Then be sure to head on over to it's not rocket show.com and pick up your free gift from Dr. Sung. Then join us on the next episode. <laughs>